This Is Actually Happening features real experiences that often include traumatic events. Please consult the show notes for specific content warnings on each episode and for more information about support services. He's pushed me closer and closer, my feet are dangling on the edge. He like nudges my knees outside the door so my feet are dangling. And he finally says, are you ready? I was like, no, but let's do it. And he said, any last words? And I said, yes. I hope my parachute opens. From Wondery, I'm Whit Misseldine. You are listening to This Is Actually Happening. Episode 334. What if your parachute didn't open? My dad's name is Brian, and he is... Very Australian, very ochre type of blokey bloke, as we would say. Very hard worker, truck driving, being a mechanic, building fences, just real manly, laborious jobs. And that's something I've always admired. My dad left school at 15 to be a mechanic and to start looking after his family. And my mum was in a similar situation. She left school at 13. Her mum made her work in a shoe factory. My mum as well has also done a lot of labour. She's worked in bakeries, she's worked at truck stops and diners. A lot of jobs where you're pushing yourself to the limits. So, really amazing work ethic. My parents met when they were very young and they've just stayed the same. They're just madly in love 40 plus years later. Their big dream was to just own property. So they grew up in Melbourne, but decided to buy a six acre block in a very small country town called Pylong, which is where I grew up. It's about 90 minutes north of Melbourne. And this is the outback. This is what people call rural Australia. This is the bush. So it's a bit of no man's land out there, but mum and dad bought a huge property and wanted to build their own house. So growing up, the house was always half finished, but... A house full of love. I think it was a very special childhood to grow up so far in the country in a house that my dad built himself. Mum and dad's work ethic is something that I really cherish and something that I'm very proud of. Mum and dad always made sure that we appreciated everything that we had, even though we were definitely working class and struggling to make ends meet. But I would have had no idea as a kid because I genuinely thought we we were plentiful. We had everything. There's just something special about growing up so far away just to embrace the landscape that we live on. Australia is beautiful and I got to experience it firsthand. The town I grew up in probably had about 200 people there. It basically just had a general store, a little milk bar and a pub. The Pylon pub was just the meeting point. We would always go there always have family meals. If it was someone's birthday, we'd go down to the pub and you just knew everyone. We were always throwing parties. Mum would run the debutante balls. She'd run the tennis club. We were very community minded. I've got three older sisters and I was basically just, I wouldn't say a black sheep of the family, but definitely the cheeky one that got away with a lot. I always describe it as having four mums because I've got three sisters and my mum and they're all very loud and gregarious where my dad is more of the strong silent type. Being the only boy from a very young age, I feel like I was kind of thrown around, put on dresses, put on makeup, do little shows. I was kind of like the fun, new, exciting thing in the family. I'm the fourth girl. That's how we joke around in my family. So I got a lot of hand-me-downs from my sisters. And it's cute looking back, but I think at the time, I always just wanted to be a big independent adult. In rural Australia, what a man's man is, is like the default. It is outlaw country. 
you could do whatever you want out in the Australian bush. It's a rough upbringing. And you pair that with this like Australian blokey stoicism and people aren't talking about their feelings out there. There's a certain idea of what a man should be or what you grow up to be. So it really helps you develop a thick skin, but I think in a way that stops you from letting people in. I was definitely really young when I started to feel different, maybe five or six, but nothing I could ever really latch onto and think, oh, this is me being different. So I always had to tone it down. I always had to not cry in public and not cause a scene and always be very well behaved. Hide yourself. Don't be too flamboyant. Don't be too girly. You shouldn't care if there's dirt on your clothes. You know, you should get rough and tumble. But I just wasn't really like that. I was more like my sisters and I didn't have the language for it at the time, but I was like, oh, I've got a girl's brain. I read the same books and I like the same TV shows. Sometimes I wear their hand-me-downs and also my personality being a bit more sensitive and more on the nurturing side. I felt like there was something wrong with me because I didn't really fit into my environment. I was a child of the obese experience, <laughs> I would say, for lack of a better word. I'm still looking back and I'm not really sure what the genesis is of me being an overweight kid. I think I just ate my feelings a lot. I think not growing up with a lot of money, it means that quite often we probably weren't eating the healthiest food. Going to high school, I was kind of the perfect trifecta of overweight, gay and emo at a private Catholic boarding school in rural Australia. It got really, really hard. I didn't see anyone else around me that really looked like me or felt like me. So high school was really, really rough. I just hated myself. I went from this really small, cute primary school in the country. I was school captain and we knew everyone. There's only 40 kids there. And then I go to a really big high school in the next town over and it gets really scary. There's bullying involved. I'm aware of my body. Socially, that's when I noticed that I was a bit different because all this talk about girls, that's when I started to have to pretend, just putting on a bit of a show. I laugh at it now because it's so hilarious that I'd have to sit there and be like, oh yeah, boobs. Mm. But at the time, you're backed into a corner and it feels like people know your secret and they know there's something wrong with you deep down and they're trying to bait you to say something or they're trying to put a little test on you. That's how it feels. I didn't see anything around me that validated me. So I think that led me to turn on myself and I really just snowballed with that self-hatred. I just belittled myself into denial so much that I've convinced myself that it's not the truth. From a mental health point of view, when I look at high school, I see a sad kid. I spent so much time in my room just hiding away, but then every now and then having to re-emerge for something and like put on a little show. At 15 and 16, my world felt so small. I just go from this country town to that country town, feeling like I'm a gross, disgusting monster. I did a student exchange in college in the US. I went to Louisiana State University. And as a 20-year-old from the country going straight to LSU, that was crazy. <laughs> that was a really interesting place to go. And I'd never been to America before and I land straight in Baton Rouge. But finally being an independent person and finally going where no one knows me, that was really liberating. All these thoughts, once I landed, they started to disappear. I became this new version of myself with confidence and with charm and being Australian, people just want to talk to you. So it was really easy to make friends and I made a really amazing friend, one of my best mates to this day. We decided to travel after my student exchange. We're just going around Asia, super cheap trip, little backpackers trip. And I just remember feeling like I really trusted this person. I'd never really made a real solid best friend I felt like I could tell my feelings to. And I eventually got to the point where I made my little confession, which was, I think I might slightly have the tiniest bit of attraction to the same sex. 
I was expecting to be ostracized or the rest of the trip to be awkward, but his response was so casual. It was just, oh God, man, no worries. Like, go back to Australia and go experiment. Enjoy yourself. Sorry for the accent, but it was encouraging after what was the most terrifying thing. It kind of blew my mind in that moment that he's right. It's not a big deal. And I should just do whatever I want. And that's exactly what I did. As soon as I landed back, I started to dabble out there and jump into the gay world. And it was terrifying and intimidating and fun and scary and emotional. But that was the start of the rest of my life and finally accepting myself. The very first date I went on, I was still living with my parents. I drove two hours to go to some dude's house. I was terrified the entire time. I was nervous. I was shaking. I was going to back out. I'm like, do I even feel this? What's going on? And eventually we meet up and we're at his house and he puts his arm around me. It was the most nothing gesture, but my whole world came crashing down. I was like, this is it. (laughs) I'm feeling like feelings and I'm feeling good and it's all very exciting. It was crazy. It felt like freedom. I felt like I had finally found myself. I think coming out really alleviated a lot of the other stresses I was feeling, particularly with my body and how I viewed myself. It was weird to then be viewed as a potential partner for people when I didn't really see myself as that worthy. So in my early 20s, when I start dating and putting myself out there, I finally feel like I'm part of the club, like I'm doing what everyone's been doing for so long. I just got rid of some of those demons I was putting on top of myself, the negative self-speak and the self-criticism and always putting blame on myself. I felt confident. I loved my body. I had been out for a couple of years at this point. I had just gotten to a new relationship and it was very exciting. Probably the biggest thing was getting a really great job in breakfast radio, something that I'd tried to do for years and years and years at that point. I just idolized these radio stations in Melbourne that I'd listened to my whole life. And I finally got a job offer for a breakfast radio station in Melbourne. I was their digital producer. And it was a great foot in the door because my ambition was to be on the radio. So at the age of 22, I felt like I was on the precipice of the rest of my life. Everything was just going so well. With my birthday coming up, I kind of knew I wanted to do something big and I wanted to do something celebratory. And for my 21st birthday, I was given this voucher to do some sort of extreme activity. And there were things like hot air ballooning, rally car racing, skydiving was one of them. And I thought, cool, let's use it for this birthday before the 12 months. And the most extreme thing you can do is skydiving. So let's do that. I'd always loved being cheeky and pulling pranks and having a laugh. So skydiving was not out of the realm of imagination for me. When I'm organizing the skydive, there's a lot of choices that go into it. There's different locations around Melbourne, even the time of day. For me, it was a no-brainer for what I had to choose. It had to be on a Saturday. I wanted it to be the last jump of the day. So I get the most amount of time at the airport. I wanted to do something in the country to harken back to my country roots and I thought the landscape would look the most beautiful from so high up. So I've made all these choices and I'm getting to the airport in typical guy family fashion. My whole family's there. My three sisters, their husbands, my mum and dad, my niece and nephews, my boyfriend at the time. But I remember being really nervous. I was sweating. I wasn't really feeling happy. I wasn't really feeling talkative. I remember running through all the safety briefings and they put you in the pants and the jacket and they test the parachute on you. You go through all these techniques. But even throughout this whole process, I'm not feeling very excited. I'm just feeling nervous and I really just wanted to get it done. And I was anticipating for so long because there were so many delays throughout the day. So many delays that they actually said to us at one point, do you mind if we move you to another day? And I said, no, 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 let's just do it today and get it over and done with. I was excited to do it, but I was just scared. It was very mixed emotions. And the staff that usually work at these skydiving centers, they're so casual. I think the energy just felt like you're at a carnival about to jump on a ride. 
I eventually get introduced to the tandem instructor. His name is Bill. And he's just your typical skydive master. Like he's done this a gazillion times. He was a very well-respected skydive person. So he kind of put my mind at ease a lot. And we eventually get into the plane. As we're going up in the air, this plane is so small and so rickety. There's not even seats in it. You kind of feel every bump as you're going up 15,000 feet in the air and you can't hear anything. So you have to shout in each other's ears. I'm strapped in front of him and he's behind me and he's edging close to the door. And even my feet are digging into the plane. Even with the door opening, I'm trying to stop him from pushing me towards the edge as we're getting closer and closer to actually jumping. Once we reach altitude and the door opens, just the force of the wind was terrifying. It's deafening. It's so loud. He's pushing me closer and closer. My feet are dangling on the edge. He like nudges my knees outside the door. So my feet are dangling. And he finally says, are you ready? I was like, no, but let's do it. And he said, any last words? And I said, yes. I hope my parachute opens. I think at the time, I was just making a stupid, dark joke. And it wasn't the only dumb joke. I said something like, oh, buy me a drink first, with him being strapped to me. So to have my last words actually be, yeah, I hope my parachute opens. Ugh, what an idiot. So what happened next is the countdown, the three, two, one. And I'm pretty sure the tandem instructor left on two. So I remember not being prepared for this plunge. You are falling and you feel really, really heavy and you tumble a couple times. The noise is deafening. It's euphoric. It feels amazing. This seven to eight seconds of free fall, I remember smiling. Just an insane experience. And I can see why people would be addicted to that because it's such a short burst of feelings, but it does feel amazing. You are cheating death. I knew to expect this free fall to last that long, but I was also expecting a slowdown. There's meant to be a huge velocity shift and I do feel some movement behind me, but I didn't really feel a lot of slowing down. That's when I first got curious as to what's going on. I feel a bit more scrambling behind me and that's when I look up and I can see what looks like two parachutes. There's a white parachute and there's a blue and yellow parachute and they are tangled together and crumpled up. So with what limited mobility I have, I'm trying to look behind me and I'm trying to talk to my instructor and he's yelling, keep your knees down, keep your knees down, stay still. And there's elbows flying. It looks like maybe he's got a knife. He's like grabbing onto things. And at this point, we just start tumbling completely out of control to the point where my harness is coming loose, a shoe came off, we're shaking so much, like shaking violently at 80 kilometers an hour. So extremely disorienting. And I'm just trying to stay still. I'm trying to keep my knees down. I'm trying not to fall out of my harness. I'm trying to hold on. He's obviously moving cords or grabbing onto things. Like he's trying to open these parachutes and he's trying to maneuver us somewhere. So I think he's trying to regain control over the situation where I'm just a passenger and feeling a bit useless and kind of just have to sit there and endure what is happening. I knew that this was it. I knew it was going to come. I knew it was going to be painful. I 100% had accepted death in that moment, like a peaceful knowingness. The earth was coming closer and closer, so the acceptance of death came from my surroundings. It was happening so quickly and it wasn't getting fixed. My body's response of feeling trapped in this situation, I think also led me to the acceptance that this will be my death. Surrender is the word that comes to mind because there is no choice in the matter. It wasn't calm or tranquil. I wouldn't say peaceful. It wasn't that sort of acceptance. It was, this is happening. 
it actually felt very fact-based and less this spiritual calm response of yep i'm going to die see everyone it's been lovely the weird thing is i felt guilty even in that moment and this is the one thing that people are most confused by and i'm confused by it as well how did i so viscerally feel guilt while i'm falling but i kind of felt in that moment that my whole family were watching me And I could kind of see myself from their perspective and feeling guilt, feeling like I had brought my family there to watch me die. So I think the guilt started to set in from there of like something wrong is happening. Brad, you've done something wrong. You've brought this on yourself. Criticism, criticism. There is a through line here. (laughs) Like you are bad. You did this thing to yourself. I put it on myself as I did this. This is my fault. And that just burned itself into my DNA. My instructor, he was able to somehow maneuver us to a golf course, which was a few kilometers away from the airport. And we land on the embankment of a lake, literally on hard ground and ricocheted into the water. When I hit the ground, the first thing I remember feeling was this searing pain half my body was on fire just agonizing pain and i'm trying to breathe i'm trying to grasp onto some sort of air so i'm winded i'm just like (gasps) there's half a parachute on my face so i'm trying to shift that off me i notice that i can't really move my legs i can't really move my back or my shoulders so i'm just using my hand to try to get rid of this parachute on top of me I noticed that Bill is still harnessed to me and he's half underneath me. We're sort of perpendicular to each other. I can see that he's unconscious and he's not making any movements. I'm trying to grab his hand. I'm trying to squeeze it. Just saying, Bill, wake up. Please wake up. There isn't any response from him. And at this point, I just start hysterically sobbing. I had no idea what was going on. I can't move. I can't feel my legs. And then I notice... We're half in a lake. (laughs) The reason I can't feel my legs is because I'm in this cold body of water. I don't even know where I am. I was just very disoriented. I had no answers for anything. All I knew is that something very bad has happened. At this point, I didn't really feel dead or alive. For me, I still felt like I'm on the brink. I must be going soon. Just the breathlessness and the pain. I didn't feel like I had survived. When I couldn't feel my body and I was lying on top of Bill, my mind started to come to. And with him not waking up, I thought, oh, he's dead. And I'm responsible for their death. And with not being able to feel my legs, I also thought, okay, I'm a paraplegic. I'll never walk again had already accepted and convinced myself that that was the truth. I still felt like I could die and that death was coming at some point, if not now, a little bit later. So I had just jumped to a lot of these answers, the worst case scenario answers, as a way to make sense of what was going on. My main focus was just trying to wake up Bill. And that's when I start to hear some people walking over and it was a golf buggy and there were three people and they're helping separate us. And they're trying to talk to us and say, everything's going to be okay. We saw it happen. We saw you fall. We're going to be okay. We've called the ambulance. I'd completely forgotten that I was even skydiving that day and things started to make more sense. So we get separated. It's agonizing. I was screaming in pain. Bill starts to come to, thankfully, he's crying, he's in agonizing pain as well, and we're both just laying on the ground with our harnesses and the parachute next to us at the embankment of a lake on a golf course. It's a very chaotic situation. I hear the ambulance come on over, and Bill starts to get airlifted in a helicopter. And as I'm getting put in the back of the ambulance, that's when I start to hear my family. I can hear my mum. I can hear my sister. I can hear my boyfriend at the time. I couldn't move my body. I couldn't move my neck or look around, but I could hear their voice. That was the moment I knew something was really wrong. 
just hearing my mum and hearing her say, it's okay, you're going to be okay, we love you, we'll see you at the hospital. I could just hear how scared she was. Just hearing her cry and tell me I was going to be okay, I just felt so bad. And I, I wish I didn't, but I just do. So, and getting lifted up and getting my clothes taken off me and getting morphine injected into me and getting lights shone into my eyes and getting asked questions. I'm getting cut out of my clothes as well. It was just a frantic frenzy. All of that energy and that movement and people pulling me this way and that way while I'm on the way to the hospital. That's when it started to really sink in. It became real. There was no question anymore. Am I dead or am I alive? I'm clearly alive and there's things happening around me, but I can't feel my body. I can't look around. And it took me a very long time to discover what actually happened and what my injuries were. I still don't know what's happened, but I know something really bad has happened. I'm in the emergency room and I've got a neck brace on. I'm on a bed just staring straight up at the ceiling. Don't really have a lot of energy in my voice or in my body to even ask questions. I've got my boyfriend there who's relaying a lot of information to me. My mum and dad eventually arrive and I can't even look at them because I can't move my neck. So they're having to stand over me and all I can see is how upset they are. I had no answers for anything. I was just on all this morphine and getting these injections and taking these pills and getting these scans and it was all completely overwhelming. Eventually later on in that evening, they were able to tell mum and dad what my injuries were. I had torn the ligaments in my neck and I had broken my upper spine and fractured my lower spine, as well as a bunch of bruised ribs, some scratches. But the main things were my spine and my neck, which is why I couldn't move. The good news there was that I do have functioning legs. I'm not a paraplegic. They didn't know technically what had happened. Mum and dad didn't know, even though they saw the whole thing. The doctors didn't get any information other than parachute incident is what it was called. So I still wasn't sure what had actually happened to me. I didn't know that I had free fallen. I kind of just assumed maybe a bad landing. My hospital stay was very confusing. I couldn't walk for the first few days, couldn't really leave the hospital bed, couldn't really sit upright uh, for four days. Very, very scary that first night in hospital. My family had to leave and I'm laying flat for four days straight, just looking completely vertically at the ceiling, <laughs> which I, I was literally like counting the dots in the ceiling. I kept calling the nurse and I was begging her to knock me out. I was like, you have to give me morphine, you have to give me some sleeping pills because every time I close my eyes, I feel myself falling and I'm getting dizzy, I'm getting sick. I remember hearing the wind and hearing the sound of the parachutes in the wind and hearing distant muffled yelling. It felt very immersive and felt very real. Even in hospital, I felt like I was becoming the parachute guy. So people had heard about my story. It was on local news that day as well, but I still didn't even really know technically what had happened. It didn't ever feel like I had survived this crazy, miraculous thing <laughs> where the, the odds are one in a trillion. I just felt like I was in an accident. When I was discharged and I was in a wheelchair leaving the hospital, I was just terrified. It was the same as being in the plane. I was digging my heels in. I just didn't want to go back home because I felt safe in the hospital. But venturing back out to home is when I felt like I had to actually face the consequences of what had happened, and it was terrifying. I didn't see a future for myself, and I felt so broken. I needed assistance everywhere, needed assistance eating, going to the bathroom. I had to be lifted into things and out of things. I felt humiliated just because I was so hell-bent on my independence. I don't live at home anymore. I've got an amazing new job. I'm going to move into the city and be with my boyfriend. Everything was just going so perfectly. I wanted to do all these things that I was already doing in my life, but I got derailed and I just didn't want to face the world 
as this new version of myself, which felt like a broken, destroyed, useless victim. That first stage of my recovery, it was a four month period where I was in a neck brace and a back brace. I was on Oxycontin and Endone, and I basically didn't leave my room for four months. It was just a dark vortex that whole time. Not only are those painkillers very intense, they knock you around. They're very numbing. So my sleep schedule was all over the place. I was having consistent night terrors where I would wake up and I've ripped posters off the walls or like throwing pillows around and mum would have to come in and physically restrain me. Night terrors really take a grip on your whole body. A lot of them started off as just pure flashbacks of the accident where I'd be trying to go to sleep and then I get jolted awake because I'm feeling myself falling. As soon as I get comfortable, as soon as I feel safe, that is when my mind goes straight back to trauma. It was torture. It's happening as I'm trying to sleep. It's happening in the middle of my sleep. It happens when I nap. It happens when I think about going to sleep later on. I already get pre-anxious. They eventually evolve into different scenarios where I'm experiencing other forms of death. Something like getting steamrolled or buried alive or drowning. They eventually evolve to include my family. Now I'm watching them die and I have to relive that sort of feeling over and over. I wish I could have felt more encouraged by the physical rehab, but I felt demoralized more so. Learning how to walk again, I just felt like I was starting over. And at that very, very first initial stage of my recovery, everything felt useless. I felt like I was broken. All of this felt permanent. How scared I was, the night terrors, the depression, the guilt, the shame. I thought I was always going to feel like a useless, traumatized person to the point where I'm a burden. And I felt guilty for my parents having to look after me. It was affecting my relationship. It was just a very dark time. During that four month period, I was battling with my will to live. I had fully mapped out what a future without me in it would look like for my family and for myself. Almost mechanically, I'd kind of devised how I would go about ending my life and I thought that was a solution. At that time, my world had just completely shrunk to the confines of my bedroom and I couldn't live with my body, I couldn't live with my mind and I couldn't live with this guilt I was feeling. It was just weird, so weird to accept all of that and not feel like there is hope. I had built an amazing life before that, but then with this whole derailing, I just convinced myself that it was never going to happen again and that this life that I really wanted was gone. I had just gotten myself to a place where I needed a solution and I felt like, okay, I've got all these painkillers, I know exactly methodically what I want to do and that'll be that. So I nearly did lose the will to live, but I didn't want to further the guilt on my family and I felt like there's something in them wanting to help me. I need to give this to them as well as a thank you. I have to actually give it a shot because of them trying so hard and doing everything for me. Five weeks after the accident, I saw a therapist and it was a recommendation by the hospital. I really didn't want to go. Leaving the house was already too hard. Five weeks in, I'm still unable to move. Neck brace, back brace, and I have to talk to some stranger. But I remember talking to her about how I was feeling and getting these very casual diagnoses, <laughs> which I was like, oh, I'm crazy. I'm a crazy person. I wouldn't use that language anymore, but that's how I felt at the time. I was a sheltered kid from the country. What is PTSD? What is depression? What is nightmare disorder? And in a way it did help because it made sense. I was like, oh, okay, I've got this thing. But the diagnoses also felt very overwhelming because I was just thinking, oh, there's more things wrong now. Now I've got these three mental situations. When I finally got the go-ahead to get my neck brace and back brace off in 
the December of that year, I tried to get more painkillers and they wouldn't give me any, which is totally fair and reasonable. I think that's probably the right move. So without the neck brace and back brace and without painkillers, I'm definitely on my own now. Stage two begins there, where it's literally learning how to walk again, getting driven to every appointment, resetting my entire body. How do I drive? How do I go upstairs? Basically started from scratch. That was the recovery period where I did start to feel some encouragement because I can walk to the kitchen and then I can walk to the driveway. And I just got a little bit further each and every day, simplified my life to the point where all I'm focusing on is going to psychological therapy and physical therapy. That's what made me feel more alive, that independence. My world opened up and I just had to give it time. Initially, the hardest thing for me was feeling like I was grieving my old life. I wasn't myself anymore. Just overnight, everything had completely shattered. How I viewed myself, what I was capable of, who I am as a person, completely lost myself. I will never be that person before the accident. Never, ever again. And that's actually a good thing. But it was very hard to say goodbye to the potential of my old life, having convinced myself that that was my peak. But that's how I view it, was like, there's a death and a change, and now we have to process and say goodbye to this old person. Everything was very vague at the time when it came to what actually happened with the accident. I knew it was something with the parachutes, but the information was very murky, but eventually it came through the press where I found out that it was a packing failure with the parachute. There was something that went wrong in how it was packed into its bag. And when my tandem instructor went to release the first parachute, its canopy didn't open. So it wasn't able to actually catch air to slow you down. So when he released the second parachute, the emergency parachute, it got caught in the first one. So it wasn't actually opening either. So what you have is two released parachutes that are tangled with each other and they're not going to slow you down. As part of my recovery only last year, I met up with the tandem instructor who I jumped with that day and we hadn't spoken or made contact since that day. He's a very experienced skydiver and what he told me was with all his strength He was somehow able to direct us towards the golf course with these two parachutes that had been stuck together. And it was literally just by some miracle. He didn't have a lot of control, but he knew that we had to get away from the highway and get away from buildings and get away from trees. So he directed us to a golf course. And when we hit the ground, that's when we ricocheted into the embankment of a lake. The angle we hit the ground and the location as well the ground would have been softer and the fact that the golfers found us and that they were golfing on this particular day so many things had to go right essentially what it comes down to is someone at the airport just made a mistake with packing the parachute i actually don't have any blame or ill feeling towards this person that's made a mistake either for some reason they just never ever came into my world view about the accident. I never thought, oh, this is someone else's fault. The weird thing about trauma is that I just put it on myself. I didn't take anyone else's blame except my own. I think guilt comes about as a response to trauma in a way to make sense of it. I think in my situation, I needed answers. I needed to know what actually happened. It was all so confusing and so vague and so sudden. So to find an answer, I think I had to turn to myself. Because it seems so simple, it's the hardest thing to talk about. Because so many people, the most common response I get is, oh, how could you feel guilty? It wasn't your fault. And I wish it were that easy. (laughs) I wish I could just think, oh yeah, you're right, I'm cured. But survivor's guilt is a very real thing. And 
my only reasoning is that we're trying to ask why. And the easiest thing to put the blame on is yourself usually. If a snake bites you, you're not going to chase down the snake and ask, why would you do that? You just look after the wound. So I apply that metaphor into my recovery and I try to ask why a lot less and just treat my feelings. It's been one of the most complex things to have to untangle after all this, for sure. I can be a deep thinker, but I also need to live in reality. And how I answer these questions now, 11 years later, is a couple things went wrong. Someone packed the parachute wrong and this happened. It's science. It's the world. There isn't some big picture thinking. There isn't some deep philosophical reason as to why it happened. And also, who cares about the why? The why got me to a bad place. It got me to the place of guilt and shame. So I'm not asking why anymore. But these questions of will I ever, will I ever work in radio again? Will I ever travel again? Will I walk again? I still ask myself those questions because there's so much I want to do with my life and I've been given this second chance and these questions have actually propelled me forward to now, will I ever achieve this and will I ever achieve that? And the answer is yes, because I wanted to walk again and I put one foot in front of the other and I painstakingly through tears walked again. So I need to keep asking myself, will I ever? Because if I don't ask myself those questions, then the answer to those questions will always be no. As I start to recover, I feel more confident and I do feel more excited by life, but I felt very exposed at the same time because I knew I was the parachute guy. I had become very self-conscious about being this one thing because the nature of my story is so uncommon and everyone was going to ask me questions about it. People were going to pester me on it. And they did. (laughs) All my fears came true. I remember being at one of my best friend's 21st birthday and it was the first party I'd gone to after my initial recovery period. And I literally got cornered by a bunch of her friends. I know mum like, oh my God, I heard what happened. Are you okay? Oh, that's my worst nightmare. Oh, I guess you'll never skydive again. So I started to feel extremely vulnerable. And back then I didn't know how to put boundaries up. I didn't know how to say, hey, I'm not comfortable talking about this right now. I would just give in to these obligations and answer all these questions, whether I'm at a party or at work. It didn't matter where I was. I could so easily get into a panic and have full-blown panic attacks. And I really had to learn how to just say no. Eventually, I did get to a stage where I took my mental therapy as serious as my physical therapy three and a half to four years after it actually happened, which is way too long for how I was feeling but therapy eventually did save me I was so hesitant to access these parts of my mind that I had really locked away because my deep desire to be normal made me try to bury all these feelings that I was having so I knew a therapist was going to try to extract them my first therapist was very clinical and looked at it from a real science perspective which I think helped me It made me feel like this was less of my own burden and just something that happens to people with trauma. It was validating because I started to realize, oh, this is a reaction to something that happened to me and not me being a broken, useless person. That was from day one, I had this realization. But all of the work we did was around these actual real pain points in my life, like, for example, being able to tell my story or being able to put boundaries around the questions and the curiosities I'd get asked about. So we eventually told the story over and over again to the point where we could take away the emotion from it and just turn my story from feelings to words. So they just became words that I could say, if someone did ask me a question, I can just give them the details and they can go on about their day. They don't need to know everything I feel. They don't need to know about when I lost the will to live. Not only can I take the emotion away from it, but I can say to people, I'm not comfortable right now and actually check in with my own body and be my own barometer, basically. Same with the night terrors. We really developed a nighttime routine and we looked at the science behind sleep and why I might be having flashbacks in these vulnerable moments. The fact that she was so pragmatic 
and had these real world applications for some of these therapies completely changed my life. And I didn't know therapy was that. I thought you just kind of sit down and have a bit of a chat. When I started to see the improvements, like with my physical recovery, seeing those little incremental improvements, it was the same with my mental health. I just saw so much improvement that it became addicting. I needed to break myself down and build myself back up again. I saw the guilt that I was carrying as this impossible thing. This will never leave me. And the weightlessness of having that removed, it's such a relief. You do see your world differently. And it helped me in so many other areas and so many other things I was feeling guilty about. Feeling guilty about my body, feeling guilty about my sexuality. When I started to realize that all these things that happened to me aren't a result of who I am as a person. Sometimes things just happen. So I had to remove myself from what I was feeling and look at it like my therapist. She's looking at problems to fix and not a person that has problems. As it started to unravel, I think I saw my world as something with way more potential and that dreams could come true and that I am worth it and I am strong and I am resilient. And it's challenging because we so often accept our feelings as facts, but they're just feelings. I have control over how I see myself. So am I a victim or am I a survivor? As soon as I started to see myself as something different than a victim, that's when I finally began living the life I had always wanted. I just had to bring more power back to myself. I'm not always in charge of the things that happen to me, but I'm in charge of how I respond to it. Initially, I kept thinking about this other version of myself where the accident didn't happen. I land safely, I go about my day, I start my job, and I moved to the city and I'm in a relationship and I was always thinking about this other version of myself and I just realized I can't separate myself from this experience. The magnitude of my accident is so huge and reverberates into every part of my life. It's now infused with who I am. I don't need to picture this other version of myself and in fact, it's impossible. Whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm trying to view it as more of a positive in terms of what I've been able to actually achieve and gain from this. Of course, it's brought a lot of suffering into my life, but it has been 11 years and the anniversary is coming up actually. So this time of year, I do reflect on it quite a lot and I'm still learning about this day. I'm still learning about my reaction to it. Now I see healing as this infinite forever thing and not just, oh, you know, it's been 10 years since the accident. I should probably wrap it up now, but it's complicated You basically heal forever. You just get better at managing it. I look back at this whole experience and there's gratitude there, for sure. It came at a cost, but I think that's a cost I'm willing to bear because now it actually has been such a part of my story that I can't picture myself without it. There was someone that died that day, for sure, but there are versions of myself that are dying every single day. Because I'm always growing, I'm always evolving, I'm always progressing. There will be plenty more Brads that live and die in my whole life. And I will embrace every new one. But I'm also going to acknowledge the ones that have come in the past because they make me the current version that I am. So it's all perspective. (laughs) I've had many funerals for myself. That's probably the biggest one, the accident. But at least every version that's come afterwards has been an improved one. I would like to think. The biggest difference between pre-accident Brad and post-accident Brad is I just know now what I'm doing. I know where I'm meant to go. I know who I am. If I want to be parachute guy, I can be, but I'm so much more than just a victim where this thing happened to me. I get to define myself and I'm in control of my story. I'm going to share with people how I feel. I'm going to talk about my resilience. I'm going to push myself to do greater things. I'm going to cherish my life even more. And I'm going to make it amazing for myself. It's made me a champion of my own life. And I've manifested my own destiny because I saw myself as worth it. I've been able to achieve so much just because I actually believed, you know what, I've got a second chance now. If I can survive that, I can survive anything. 
So I deep down know what I'm capable of because I've been pushed to my absolute limits. And my life is exciting now, truly. I'm at an interesting juncture, I feel. I am ready to travel and see the world. I've always wanted to live overseas and I just got a brand new job, which is fully remote. And I look at my future and I'm very excited to just work and heal and prosper. I'm just going to live big. I don't really have any plans (laughs) for the first time. I don't have any plans rather than to just live as big as possible, enjoy this second chance and do whatever the fuck I want. I just can't believe what I've been able to do because I kept showing up for myself and I'm ready for more. Today's episode featured Brad Guy. If you'd like to reach out to him, you can email him at hello at bradguy.com. Or you can find him on Instagram and TikTok at Brad J. Guy. Visit bradguy.com to order his memoir, Freefall, and to book him for speaking engagements. From Wondery, you're listening to This Is Actually Happening. If you love what we do, please rate and review the show. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or on the Wondery app to listen ad-free and get access to the entire back catalog. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. By supporting them, you help us bring you our show for free. I'm your host, Whit Misseldine. Today's episode was co-produced by me, Andrew Waits, and Aviva Lipkowitz, with special thanks to the This Is Actually Happening team, including Ellen Westberg. The intro music features the song Ilibai by Tipper. You can join the community on the This Is Actually Happening discussion group on Facebook or follow us on Instagram at Actually Happening. On the show's website, thisisactuallyhappening.com, you can find out more about the podcast, contact us with any questions, submit your own story, or visit the store, where you can find This Is Actually Happening designs on stickers, t-shirts, wall art, hoodies, and more. That's thisisactuallyhappening.com. And finally, if you'd like to become an ongoing supporter of what we do, go to patreon.com slash happening. Even 2 to $5 a month goes a long way to support our vision. Thank you for listening. 